Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, welcome to Season 5 of Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears featuring in-depth conversations with fascinating people from sport and politics, science and culture, business and beyond. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. You can also listen to old episodes. There are 190 in the back catalogue, including chats that truly run the gamut, with everyone from Tex Perkins to Kieran Perkins. Meet the brightest of the bright from Hollywood, like Guy Pearce or Taika Waititi. Hear from our best authors, like Richard Flanagan and Julia Baird. Listen to crusaders and campaigners like Danielle Laidley and Craig Foster, or outstanding athletes like Joel Selwood and Peter Bolt. There's even a pair of Australians of the Year in there, in Grace Tame and Dylan Alcott. It's fitting to mention Dylan, actually, as we're in situ for the first episode of 2024, on location, as it were, recording from the Australian Open at Melbourne Park. Our guest? Former tennis star, author, now inspirational Nine commentator, Yelena Dokic. Yelena burst onto the scene in 1999 when she was just 16. Ranked 129 in the world, she knocked over then world number one Martina Hingis, launching a career full of promise. Behind closed doors, of course, she had already survived a decade of abuse at the hands of her father. She famously overcame or survived that adversity to eventually become the number four player in the world, retiring from tennis 10 years ago, and has since become an advocate on mental health, body positivity, and online abuse. Welcome, Yelena. Thank you, thank you for having me. Ah, it's so great to be here. Um, Now, you were absent from our screens uh, during the recent Adelaide International Mm -hmm. after coming down with a virus. uh, Yeah. Feeling better? Yeah, I am, a couple days. Uh, I was still glad to be able to be in Perth for the United Cup and then Brisbane to cover the semis and the finals and uh, yeah did a couple days in Adelaide Uh, came down with a virus unfortunately so I had to get back to Melbourne Uh, but yeah hopefully I'll I'll get to do Adelaide again next year it is one of my kind of favourite tournaments uh, as a commentator as well and uh, yeah hope to do it again. Is this your favourite though are you where you want to be? Yeah absolutely look Australian Open is incredible it's special Uh, it's one of a kind the buzz the atmosphere it always was like like that for, for me as a player as yep. well. Yep. So to be able to do what I love with commentary and with TV, but to be able to do it at home and home Grand Slam, I think sometimes we almost forget how lucky we are to have a Grand Slam yep. uh, you know, in Australia. And especially for me, I live in Melbourne. I live literally five minutes from here. I can almost see Rod Laver Arena from my <laughs> from my apartment. So, uh, yeah, it's very special. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm just glad to be able to be a part of uh, the whole summer of tennis because we've got amazing events and it goes on for, you know, three weeks even before the Australian Open starts. But, yeah, Australian Open is special and uh, for me working with Nine as well because we do so many different amazing things. It's not just calling matches, but it's on court interviews as well. It's all the pre-shows and the news. So we're really a part of, like, we're really giving tennis the platform, which is amazing. And, uh, yeah, we haven't had this much tennis in Australia on TV and, and so many matches and that's been done the way that Nine has done it uh, ever. I'm really glad to be a part of that. Talk to me about what you love about tennis. I love asking athletes what it was that they fell in love with Mm -hmm. about a game that they played when they were a kid. Look, I have so much love and passion for the game. I always have. I I say it and I've said it so many times that uh, when I hit that very first tennis ball, I I fell in love with tennis. I was always very competitive as a kid. I loved individual sports. I like the fact that it was all kind of up to me out there on the court, win or lose. But I actually genuinely just like hitting balls and being competitive uh, and having that goal of of having to hit the ball in and and having to compete against the the other person. But also, I think ultimately, uh, the way that I think my personality is, I like to push myself and, and challenge myself and get outside of that comfort zone. And tennis is that. Tennis is very technical and tactical as well but yeah I have passion for the game and I love watching it I love commentating talking about it so yeah Yeah. uh, anything that has to do with tennis I love and I loved it as a player 
despite I think uh, some of the adversity that I went through in the sport uh, and yeah I uh, to be honest with you I really enjoy this part now to be able to not be a player mm. but be able to still talk about tennis. Of course your, your backstory is so famous you were, mm-hmm. you were born in the former Yugoslavia mm-hmm. now Croatia and then yeah. fled war to Serbia when you were just eight yes leaving home I, I listened to an interview with you the other day saying yep. left home with two plastic bags mm-hmm. and two tennis rackets yeah I think you saw your first dead body a couple of days eight. before yeah, you left um, yep. and your family thought things would get better and you'd be able to go back but that kind of didn't come to pass and you were stranded yes so look we never really had a lot when I was growing up uh, anyway and yeah the war erupted in 1991 Good evening. We begin again tonight in Yugoslavia, which the U.S. believes may be on the verge of coming apart at the seams. International concern now focuses on the federal army and what action it may take against the two Yugoslav republics which have declared their independence, Slovenia and Croatia. An enormous convoy, hundreds of tanks and thousands of soldiers, rolled out of the national capital Belgrade this morning, headed for the two republics. Very, very quickly, literally overnight, uh, we had to leave. And at the same time, though, uh, everyone kind of, in a way, thought that it would settle down quickly. No one really, I don't think, really uh, thought or believed that it would escalate um, the way that it did. And, yeah, just uh, my tennis rackets and literally what we were wearing and a a couple of uh, plastic bags. And that was it. How difficult is it to sort of find hope in that kind of setting? You mentioned there was, it's a shed infested yeah. with rats you have no heating yeah. limited water yeah. your brother's only three months old yeah look it's a it's a shock but it also makes you grow up very very quickly and uh yeah to be a refugee is not easy uh and just even fearing for your life and you're very aware of that already as a kid when you're eight years old and yeah my brother was only three months old we lived in very difficult conditions once we did get uh, to serbia and uh, yeah, we were lucky if we had bread to eat. Uh, I was standing with my mum at 4 a.m. Uh, at the Red Cross, waiting to be able to get some necessities. So yeah, it was tough, but it, it, it has shaped me into the person that I am today. And mm. at the same time, it makes you realize that a lot of the things you don't have control over, uh, adversity can happen in all different forms. And yeah, today uh, I'm grateful to I think have gone through that, survived it, and it makes me, I think, a much more grateful person today. So I think ultimately, even with that part of my story, there's obviously a lot of others, but it has served and I wanted to serve as something where uh, people can hopefully realize that adversity, you can get through it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's how you rise above that and how you come out of that and that you can come out of that stronger. Andre Agassi was driven by a very controlling parent Mm -hmm. to the point that he kind of hated tennis and hated it with with a passion, even as he excelled. As you grew and began to show talent Mm -hmm. and and got great, how did you feel about the game? Like, was tennis an escape or was it a prison or...? No, I loved being on the court. Uh, Did I have extremely difficult moments because of that, because of my father? Yes, absolutely, but I... Uh, I never hated the game and I think to be honest with you I'm lucky in that sense and uh, I do know that certain athletes and tennis players that have had bad experiences with parents or uh, you know with very abusive parents or even coaches did end up not liking the game and it really uh, yeah they they got out of the sport later and didn't ever want to have anything to do with it again uh, which is very sad so uh, yeah, I, I've loved it always. I think I'm lucky that I never uh, got to, to to that point myself because I loved tennis so much. And even though I had uh, and faced extreme abuse at the hands of my father, uh, and I always kind of had to win. And even if I won, I would still at times be beaten and be abused. And uh, yeah, I had some very difficult moments where I was beaten and kicked and punched to the point of being unconscious. And uh, yeah, even a very tough moment for me at Wimbledon when I was 17 and made the semi-finals. Dokic getting on the offensive. Love 30. Straight away from the return of serve. I think Lindsay Davenport was very offended by this shot of Dokic's. Dokic does not seem uh, very respectful. Yeah, she's not daunted by this. But oh, it, it was not good enough and yeah. my father didn't allow me to come back to the hotel. I had to sleep on the grounds of Wimbledon. 
Destino. Doki's starting to look over after every point at her uh, father. Sometimes you see her looking over and she looks scared. So that's very tough to go through and it would be understandable if you hated the game and didn't like it. But I think I'm lucky that that didn't happen. And I, I, I always say, and I've said it in my books, tennis and the sport is not to blame uh, just because of, you know, an abusive person and, and, and their views and how they treated me. So, yeah, but uh, I'm lucky. I have to really say I am lucky because I have now done this for seven years where tennis is such a big part of my life and what I do and I hope to you know, be able to continue doing that. What a wonderful yeah. sense of perspective. Yeah. You have written two books about your experiences yeah. you just mentioned. First, Unbreakable, and then just last year, Fearless. Mm -hmm. um, I've helped people work on their memoirs before, and mm -hmm. it's a really interesting dynamic between subject and, and ghost. What was it like for you working with, um, it was award-winning sports journalist, Jess Halloran. Jess Halloran. Yeah. Um, what was it like pouring your heart out to somebody and kind of trusting them mm -hmm. to do justice to your story in, yeah. in print? Oh, it was actually quite, uh, it was weird at first because I don't even think that I fully trusted her. She, she knows this. We talked about this. Yeah. I, I knew Jess uh, and she's amazing. And if it wasn't for her uh, passion to want to tell my story because she knew a little bit about the background because we spoke about it before going She'd into my book. She'd written a profile story, yeah. hadn't she? But if it wasn't for her passion to actually help me bring that to light, I never would have done that. And and who knows, to be honest with you, if I would even be here today because I say that Unbreakable uh, has saved my life and it really has. Uh, so, yeah, I don't really think I did, uh, but it's a process where you go, okay, I've decided to do this. There's For me, there were very big and personal reasons why I decided to write uh, Unbreakable, which was my memoir, and that was ultimately the number one reason was to be able to tell my story to help someone because I felt like a lot of the time I didn't have that help or I didn't uh, know how to deal with certain things because we didn't talk about it. It wasn't out in the open and it wasn't something that uh, you kind of necessarily knew how to deal with because people weren't open about it. So you couldn't resonate with anyone. I didn't really have anyone where I can go, oh, well, they've been through domestic violence or they've been through abuse or they've had mental health struggles. We didn't talk about this 20 years ago. So I didn't yeah. feel like I could really resonate with someone and go, well, they've been through it, but it can be done or you can get help or you can still fulfill your goals and your dreams and get through that adversity. So... Uh, the the actual process was uh, with her at the beginning was very interesting. We did a massive kind of interview process for about two weeks, hours and hours every single day. And uh, it can be tiring, can't yeah, it, it was it's mentally like draining. Yeah. But at the same time, in that moment, uh, as hard as it was, uh, it was starting to be also cathartic. Uh, but it was the most helpful and cathartic once the book came out, actually. I say to this day, it's the best day of my life ever. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, it really did change my life. So um, looking back at it, uh, I still, even though at times it was very draining, I loved the process of it. It was yeah. great. And uh, it's not easy writing a book. The editing process after the first and the second draft uh yeah, it's extremely difficult. You start to second guess yourself. You start to question things. You're thinking, is this good enough? Are people going to like this? Is this going to help someone? So yeah, it's a massive process. I loved it though. I would do it all over again. And I did it with Fearless. Yep. Uh, but I would say Fearless was a little bit easier. The only thing with Fearless is that I felt more pressure, to be honest, uh, because people loved the first sure. book so much. Yeah. And I didn't want them just to kind of get the second one because they loved the first and go, oh, but this isn't really that good. Yeah. So I still wanted them to read and go, oh, my God, this is amazing. I'm actually getting something useful out of this. So I felt more pressure and responsibility with the second one, but not in not in a bad way. Sure. Yeah. 
Now, you've recently become a kind of passionate advocate for body positivity. Yes. What prompted that and what do you get back personally from speaking in that space? It was uh, pretty much a, a similar thing. I really uh, believe in in, uh, in the power of sharing our stories and I really uh, believe in the power of speaking up to change uh, things and, and, and change uh, things when it comes to very, very difficult conversations and subjects, uh, whether it comes to sport or society. Uh, sharing my story and speaking up has changed my life. I was able to find my voice. I was able to find my power. Uh, I was silenced for my whole life and that's how I grew up and from the very first day that I started playing tennis, the number one rule was never to never tell anyone anything mm. or there would be massive, massive consequences. Uh, people that have read Fearless will know how I start Fearless and the book I start with, don't you dare say anything, don't you dare say anything to anyone ever because I will kill you because those were the words that were repeated to me pretty much daily by my father. So that's what really shows uh, uh, what domestic violence and child abuse, family violence really is. So for me to actually speak up was massive because I had to get over the fear. Uh, it takes extreme courage to be vulnerable and to speak up. But I don't think we view that in society and in sport as something that's powerful. We look at it as a weakness. And if you're vulnerable, you are looked at kind of in sport that you, you're you weak, like you're losing your edge towards your opponents as well. And even kind of you feel like towards the fans that maybe you're not good enough. So I wanted to completely kind of shatter that myth as well. Uh, and yeah, I think when it comes to body positivity and body image as well, uh, that's what I wanted to do. We don't talk about it. It's one of those things where it's like this big elephant in the room, yep. but it's all around us, especially yep. with social media. I even faced it as a tennis player. I mean, I was a size two, uh, you know, size two, size four when I was playing. And I still, uh, in Fearless, I put down quite a few examples of uh, how even then uh, I had articles written about me. We all do. Uh, and we're really judged based on the way that we look. Uh, and as an athlete, you kind of go, okay, you are kind of in good shape anyway. Uh it can be kind of a part of a, part of a sport, but I don't think that it should be mentioned ever in any body shaming kind of way or in a negative way. But when I got out of sport, and obviously I had my own uh, issues with an eating disorder, which I opened up about in Fearless, that I didn't even underst understand that I and didn't know I had up until recently uh, and that I've had it for more than a decade. Well, because food was weaponized exactly. since you were a child. Yeah, right? but it was also something then later on I used as safety. Yeah. For me, I didn't have a family, a supportive family. I didn't have uh, a lot of the time a home and it already started as a kid. So for me, food was my safety and my thing that would never let me down. And once you get into kind of that cycle, it's very hard to stop that. Even though I'm mentally so good and strong today, it's something that now I get treatment for and still those kind of, I would say, it comes from trauma, uh, it still stays with you. It can stay with you for, for your whole life. So I kind of knew this going into fighting, let's say, the trolls um, yep. and talking about body positivity, but I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because I think, again, uh, I'm a big believer in being kind. I'm a big believer in, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say to someone, don't say it at all. I really, advice. yeah, but I also really believe in, in some of those really important core values, uh, like being kind and, and, you know, if you want to judge me, not that anyone should judge anyone, but do it on my work ethic, do it on my, you know, if I'm a good person, if I'm kind, I don't think that size should define a person. That's yep. for me, a, a really kind of shallow thinking. And I wanted to get that out, but I also know that a lot of people go through what I go through. And I wanted to stand up for others. I wanted that to be out there. I wanted to be very open about it. Uh, and I wanted, yeah, I just kind of thought, well, maybe someone will read this. Maybe a 14-year-old girl will read this and go, you know what? Uh, yeah, thank you for doing that because that means a lot to me. Uh, and I want people to know that they need to believe in themselves and they're, they're worthy and not the other way around. So it was very important for me actually to do that. Yeah. Just as important 
as telling my story about domestic violence and mental health. Yes. Yeah. You posted on Instagram um, the week prior to the Open about the Australian summer mm -hmm. and your job as a commentator for Nine and you become known for these lovely, authentic, warm, yeah. on-court interviews. But this particular post kind of hinted at the pressure mm -hmm. that you feel. Mm -hmm. And I'll read a little bit here. Yeah. It's such a big and important time and all eyes and ears are on me, my commentating and my TV work. I overthink. Am I too tough on myself? And I doubt myself. Mm -hmm. So how do you get past that to a kind of place of acceptance, knowing that you can't please everyone, yeah. that you might make mistakes? Yeah, and... I actually had a conversation with someone uh, yesterday about that uh, and how I've been overthinking here uh, since we started on Sunday. And I'm very open about that because for me, for example, I'm going through uh, a different period now compared to six years ago or seven years ago when I started in commentary. Uh, and I think it's been five or six now with nine uh, because I kind of feel like I'm a little bit more established and also uh, I've come a long way. But now you're also uh, with that, you become... I think even more of a target on people judging every single word. It's a little bit like the pressure of having yeah. such a great breakthrough exactly. book and then needing to go. follow it up with something. Now yeah. you're an established. Or being top 10, top yeah. five. Yeah. And then having to continue that. Expectations. Exactly. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, I'm an open book at this point and that's what I want to be and that's what I want to stand for. And what you see is what you get. And I think being authentic uh, and being vulnerable is such a massive strength that I want to continue putting that out into kind of the public space and social media uh, because we're taught um, we're taught something very different, I think, from a young age. And I also want to shatter this myth of perfection because it doesn't exist. Perfection doesn't exist. It's unattainable. Whenever you reach something, it's never going to be good enough because you're going to look for more. Uh, and kind of in sport and in society in general, that's how we treat people. Like, And, and then you think about what's the perfect size? There is none. Is it, no. is it zero? Is it two? Well, what's the perfect, I don't know, um, tennis player? Does one exist? Probably not. Maybe if you're Novak Djokovic because he's an alien. Um, he's not human. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. I wanted to kind of shatter that perfect the, the myth of perfection as well um and i talked about that because i'm at a stage where yeah i am overthinking i want to do better i constantly want to push myself and challenge myself uh, does it get tougher with the years as you get better and you know maybe there's little less things to improve on but they may be a little bit tougher absolutely and I wanted to put that out there because I think we all doubt ourselves, even if we're doing a great job. Yeah. I think we all overthink. Yep. We all doubt ourselves. We all think, are we good enough? And I really have come to a realization, even with commentary, look, not everyone's going to like me. They're sure. not. They're not all going to like my voice. They're not all going to like even me maybe as a person when I do an interview or, uh, yeah, and that's normal. You can't please everyone. So I think once you kind of look at it from that perspective and go, well, you know, if, for example, a million people listen to me, are they all going to like me? They're actually not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, does everyone like every single tennis player or every single athlete? No. Nope. So I think once you start thinking of it like that, you take the pressure off knowing um, that and I think it's very important also to block that noise out so I've been really trying to not uh, read comments on social media for example about my commentary even the good ones I'm trying to just limit that a little bit because it can get into your head you start thinking about oh what are people saying what are people thinking are they listening so it can be a very very um, can be a bit of chaos in your head so I'm totally. trying not to do that. And I put, wanted to put that out there if anyone else is struggling with that. Um, and it doesn't have to be commentary or sport. It can be anything else. That post got about 10,000 odd likes. Yep. And you seem to get an overwhelming response to your messages, mm -hmm. as, as might be expected of someone with 190,000 followers. Mm -hmm. um, but how often do people stop you in person to say that you've kind of made a difference in their life mm -hmm. or oh. they just appreciate it? Any yeah. specific sort of recent examples come to mind? Oh, uh, yeah, this yeah. morning. Yeah, yeah, just here, our nine compound right there. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's kind of, uh, to be honest with you, it's it's a bit surreal, you know, because I, when, when people come up and go, oh, I've really got a lot of inspiration from your post uh, or even your book, but when they go, oh, it really helps me or I really can't wait for your posts and they give me positivity or, you know, thank you for being so open and 
honest because I go through some of that negative, you know, um, stuff. So thank you for putting it out and there and showing that not everything is perfect. So uh, it's amazing to hear that actually uh, when you think about it. And uh, yeah, if if I can again, just like with my books or with who I am as a person, as a commentator, uh, why I say as a commentator is because. People know from my story in my books now that if you saw me 10 years ago, you would say, this is not the same person. No way. This is like someone completely different. Mm. Uh, I was someone that uh, couldn't look people in the eye. I couldn't string two sentences together. Now I clearly can't can't shut up. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I, uh, you know, like I couldn't get out of not just my house, my room. Um, I was locked in my room because I couldn't, I had this anxiety of even facing one person, let alone a lot of people. So uh, I, I, I want to show people that you can do a lot or, or things that you set in your mind, that dreams do come true. And uh, yeah, if I can inspire someone even with that one post and give them a little bit of, you know, something maybe that they needed for today or for this week to get them through it, then um, yeah, then I'm the happiest person, to be honest. Yeah. We should discuss tennis before we wrap up. Sure. Um, you've spoken recently about a kind of power vacuum in the women's game yeah. following the retirement of Ash Barty two years ago. Yeah. We, I think we had four different women win Grand Slams yeah. last year, for instance, with no one quite assuming the mantle as theirs alone. Um, how do you think of that all play out in the coming year or even this coming week uh, at the Open? Look, I think with Ash, because she was starting to and, and was dominating and was the number one in the world three years in a row and mm. finished number one and uh, was winning you know, Grand Slams and won two out of the last three before she retired. It's been 44 years between drinks. <laughs> but now Ash Barty has delivered Australia a Grand Slam party. Being able to, to do it here at home is really special and I think it's a bit of a, a different feeling to the other ones without a doubt. We, everyone was kind of like, oh, it's not just that she's number one winning Grand Slams, but she, she's got a difficult game. We've got a problem here. Like yeah. everyone kind of started to feel like we can't beat her. Mm. And then when she left, uh, it was kind of almost like, oh, Open We've, season. Yeah, <laughs> someone's just like, it, it's as if you have now maybe Novak Djokovic leave, literally. Yeah. Uh, it's just that she did it at a young age. So uh, I think that quite a few women had the opportunity to win Grand Slams there. They knew it. Uh, some of them got to the semis and the finals, and then uh, it kind of didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the pressure and expectation got to everyone because they were all of a sudden oh, we can not just be top 10 or top five, we can maybe be number one, number two, number three in the world. Uh, And I think that everyone was a little bit shocked with Ash retiring. So all of a sudden this pressure and expectation came through, but an opportunity came through. Mm. Uh, And Iga Sviantek has spoken about it and said, well, when Ash retired, all of a sudden, I became automatically number one in the world. But yeah, for sure, you know, Ash, changed a lot, changed kind of, you know, uh, my mindset going into 2022. And I think uh, that was like a breakthrough for me. I I was, you know, a top 10 player, but um, I was feeling that she has such a great tennis, you know, that even though I know what she's going to play, it was still tough to play. And everyone was starting to say, well, I'm not really a worthy number one because Ash left. And she even started to think like that. Sure. Obviously, she has shown us since just what a worthy number one she is but that just shows you how much even pressure and expectation she was under so I think we have uh, incredible uh, consistency with Iga I think she will win many more grand slams I even think if she stays healthy and no injury she'll go into the double digits Um, with grand slam she's already got four uh, and she's only 22 years of age I think that she will probably to be honest stay number one in the world as well just because she's so consistent throughout the whole year and can play on any surface Uh, but I think we've got rivalries uh, building with Sabalenka Rybakina and Goff Mm. Uh, you've got to put kind of I think those four as the most consistent but also if you look at their games uh, the type of game that wins a Grand Slam and uh, they've got weapons, don't yes, they? they've all won mm. one as well, yep. or at least one. And uh, they've got weapons, they've got the big game, they've got the physicality. But to me, they've also got this belief and demeanor as well. Uh, 
and are the ones that I think will challenge each other. So I think probably if I had to pick, I would say those four. But we'll see how this year develops. They're all young as well. I kind of look yeah. at them as the next gen. Uh, if you look, maybe Sabalenka and Rybakina are a couple of years older than Sviontek and Goff. Mm. But what is exciting that I think then in two or three years' time, you're going to have the Andreva mm -hmm. uh, factor. You're going to have through tier of assisters uh, and a couple of youngsters that are coming through uh, that will challenge them. So I think it's a really exciting time. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, we'll all look on and uh, yeah, really thanks again it. for thank your you time. Thank you for the chat. Yeah, thank you. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Chi Wong. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Ruby Schwartz is head of podcasting. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts.